So, I don't know what I was thinking when I was wearing stuff like that. It was kind of ludicrous and, and sad and crazy. But anyway, like I, I kind of make fun of my kids now because they, they're like, Dad, you know, um, what were you thinking? Why were you wearing that kind of stuff? Like, what was going on? And I said, just wait. When you have children, when it's a decade, two or three decades from now, you're going to wonder why you were wearing pants that had Halloween um, pumpkins on them or, you know, Santa Santa I'm say, still saying Santa Claus. Santa Claus is on them or whatever. Like, you're going to say, okay. I'm going to say it right, La LaRue. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. But you're going to be like looking at your styles and your decisions in style. And you're going to be wondering like, what was I thinking? Like, what, why was I wearing that? Why was I a participant in that? Now, if we were to expand this idea out for just a minute, I want to ask you this. What is the future self going to think when he or she looks back? What is the future self going to think when he or she looks back? Or another way, um, or another thing is, what is the current self thinking when he or she takes a look ahead? Like, what are you thinking? What is developing in your mind right now? Let's say two years, one year, two years, three years, four years, five, ten years in the future. When you look back, what are you going to wish you would have thought of? Like when you look back in your life, when you look back at your life and think about the things that have happened up to this point, are there things that you wish you would have said to yourself before they happen? If I could say it like this, hindsight, as we call it, is a landscape where regrets or redemption makes monuments. Think about that for a minute, okay? Hindsight, when we look back, when we look back, we have a landscape. We have this developed, cultivated ground. We have something that we look at. And this landscape is a place where regret or redemption makes monuments. We're going to have to realize that at some point or another, when we look at our history, when we look at our experiences, when we look what we've gone through or what we're going through, all right, a year from now, a month from now, we're going to take a look back at our life and we're going to realize that, okay, there are incredible moments of mercy. There are incredible moments of redemption. I'm going to look back and realize the landscape of my life has created many, many, many moments, many monuments of redemption. Now, oftentimes, it's the unfortunate reality of it is we look back and the whole regret thing is more focused on. You ever notice that when you look back at your life, you think about the regrets more than you think about the redemption? Like oftentimes we look back and we're like, what was I thinking? Like what could I have possibly been thinking that has brought me to this place? What could I have possibly been going on my mind when I decided, going on in my mind when I decided, when I decided that a color changing windbreaker was a cool thing to wear? Oh, you're still cool. What? <laughs> Right. Like I was going on a, a I went on the, the rafting trip with the eighth grade back when Grace was in eighth grade a couple years ago. And we're going there and they're listening to like NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. I don't know if you guys remember them, but I was just like, what is happening? I should have kept I should have kept my clothes because it's like popular now. OK, it just should have happened anyway. Like and I know that I'm talking about pants. I know that I'm talking about clothes. You know, I'm talking about hairstyles and stuff like that, but here's the truth, okay? Some of us are going to get to a place in the future, and we're going to look back on our life, and we're going to say, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Why was I doing that? Why did I make that decision? Why did I decide that this person was a good person to be with? Why did I decide to break that friendship or that relationship? Why did I decide to walk away from God? Why did I decide that I shouldn't be involved or more involved in ministry? Why did I do those things? Some of us are going to look back and wonder. Some of us are going to look back and think about the things that we should have done. And we're going to think about the landscape of life. And we're going to think about all these monuments of regret. Now, my prayer today is that I'm able to say a couple things, and, and I wanted to kind of whittle it down to less points because I, I feel like sometimes we get overwhelmed with a lot of things, and I hope you guys write these things down, and I'll get there in a second, but I want to give you guys like seven things just really fast, 
Seven things just really fast to help you understand or help you make decisions now that in the future, when you look back, when you have hindsight, you will have monuments that have victories, monuments that reveal grace, monuments that show that you have overcome because of Christ in you, because of the relationship that you have with him, because of the work that he's doing in you, rather than looking back at your life and thinking, man. Did I mess up? Now, that's not to say that, you know, if you enact all these things in your life, if you take um, into consideration everything that the scripture has to say, and, and you're like, okay, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to be it, I'm going to do it, and you go for it, that there are moments where you're going to see overwhelming victory, but in those overwhelming victories, you're going to see moments of defeat still, because we are human beings. And as much as that is frustrating and difficult, as much as that is over overwhelming at times that we are flawed that we are flawed we're going to still see those things that have happened that we have regret over maybe it was a poor moral decision maybe we were too passive or too aggressive maybe we were foolish in our spending maybe we were too much in in our hoarding and we kept things to ourselves what are we going to think? What are we going to, you know, what, what is going to move around in our mind? What are we going to consider? Romans 8, 28. I love this verse. And we know that God causes everything to work together. All right? Or, or, or written a different way. And we know that everything works together. We know that God is working everything together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We love God and we're called, all right? We love God and we're called. If you have responded to the truth, if you have responded to Christ, if you have decided that you are going to allow him to be the Lord and leader and king of your life, you recognize that he is working things in your life, that he is causing every single detail of your existence to be something so significant and so very powerful. I love the fact, even though I hate when I arrive there, I love the fact that God uses my greatest defeats for his good. Now, I'm not telling you like, okay, throw it in the air, whatever happens, happens. You know, I'm going to hit defeat, so I might as well hit it hard so that God can use it for even more. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that our greatest efforts, our greatest energies, our greatest focus on being everything that God has called us to be, we are still going to come up short. And God's like, look love you and I'm going to use this I'm going to use this for good I'm going to use this with purpose I'm going to use this intentionally I'm going to use this to show my love for you I'm going to use this to show you how wonderful I am and how big how loving how lavish my blessings are on your life I cannot tell you the amount of times in my life where I've noticed that my greatest failures became God's greatest opportunities. And so here, here just real quick, I want to outline this real quick. All right, seven things. Do what God has been telling you to do. I know that's, that's like a pretty simple statement, but you need to embrace God's direction for, for your life. Like do what God's been telling you to do. Now there are some things that you don't really have to hear from God that you read in the Bible. Like you read scripture, okay, that's God's words to you. You don't have to pray about sharing Jesus with somebody else. You don't have to pray to be benevolent. You don't have to pray to give. You don't have to pray to participate in the life of someone who is struggling. You don't have to pray to be an encourager. You have to realize that it's already recorded in the scripture. We're already told to pray. We're already told to read the Bible. We're already told to go into spiritual combat for people around us. We're already told to do those things. So we don't have to pray about those things. Yes, we need to pray in the moment that we engage those things, but we don't have to pray before we start. We don't have to. We just don't. But in this, do what God has been telling you to do. Do what God has been telling you to do. 
It could be all different things for us. It could be stepping into a new ministry role. It could be re-engaging in the school system. It could be re-engaging in the medical um, field. It could be re-engaging in many different areas. It could be making what a, others of us might consider or what other people might consider a small decision, something that's not a huge deal. Do what God has been telling you to do. Stop holding back. Stop hesitating. Stop resisting. Just do it. Just do it. Just, just get involved. Just participate. Just go for it. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word, the people are unrestrained. But happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. Like, happy is he, blessed is he. Blessed are those who hold on to the revelation of God and his word that we aren't unrestrained, but that we are focused, that we are intentional, that we begin to move forward in the plan and purpose he has for us. 2 Corinthians 4.18. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporary, just brief. They're fleeting, but the things which are invisible are everlasting and imperishable. Speaking of faith, speaking of Jesus, speaking of who God is. Do what God has been telling you to do. It's not simple, though. It's not easy all the time. It's not convenient. It's not comfortable. It's not something that, that you're just like, okay, you know, God is telling me to reach out to this person. But, man, this person, you just like, he, he or she just sucks every ounce of joy out of my life. Now, I'm not telling you to take that person in in big doses because, you know, sometimes that's a really, really bad idea. Sometimes God is telling you to do the opposite. God's telling you to get away from that person. Don't be a part of that person. Don't participate in their drama, Okay. But sometimes God is saying, all right, I've given you something. I, I've filled you up. I've, I've increased in your hope and your joy. There, there's something in you that I am sustaining that you can impart to somebody else. So get involved. Do something. What is God telling you to do? You know, some of us, it's like super spiritual. Some of us, God's like, okay, you got to stop the midnight ice cream. Like, just quit it, right? Some of us, God's like, okay, I know that Amazon Prime gives you the ability to send everything back, but you've got to stop spending so much money, right? Others of us, it's like, it's like, okay, it's time to start writing love letters to your spouse again. Or it's time to start getting on, like this last week, you know, and it only happened a couple of times, but I just really felt God saying, hey, Seth, after, um, after work, you know, when you, when you get all cleaned up and everything like that, and you're sitting with your kids in the living room, get out some board games and play. And I'm like, but God, it's been so long, you know? <laughs> and um, I, I sat down to play Sorry with, my, with uh, three of my kids, and, and, um, and like we were just playing, and I was like, you guys are doing it wrong. Like, well, this is how we play. Well, how you play is wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, how you play is not right. <laughs> oh, sometimes, sometimes. But God was telling me, hey, Seth, get involved, participate. You know, move back into those simple places with your kids, just enjoying company. My son whooped me at checkers. It was humiliating. Like, not just, like, a little bit. Like, okay, I could see if you won by, like, just a few, you know, narrow moments. No, no, no. It was, like, an overwhelming whooping. I mean, it was just, like, he had, like, all these kings, and they were, like, you know, coming on me, and I'm just, like, okay, okay. And then, like, I had two, and then I had one, and I'm just, like, you know, just dodging everywhere, and then it was over. You know, like, he just totally destroyed me. But it was worth it because I got to sit down. I got to hear him laugh. I got to hear him enjoy a part of my life. I mean, and I got to enjoy a part of his life. Do what God has been telling you to do. Embrace your identity. I know that we're on a constant pursuit of who we're supposed to be. I know we're on a constant pursuit of who God is calling us to be. But like, what is your identity? Who is God telling you you are? In Colossians 2, 8 through uh, 10, it says this, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead um, bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head 
of all principality and power. Essentially, God is through Christ in your life. He is the one who rules. Don't let anybody cheat you. Don't let anybody tell you who you are. Only let him tell you who you are. We're growing up in a culture that, you know, just like they are so good at giving you parameters of your life. They're so good at defining you. They're so good at giving you titles. You ever, you ever feel like someone else is giving you titles? Like they're just telling you who you are? They're, they're, they're like taking, you know, little tidbits of your life, little moments, little parts of your story, and they're defining for you. Like this is your identity. This is who you are. This is you. And the next thing you know, like you hear it so much, you hear it so much that you begin to believe. You begin to expect. You begin to abide by that. You begin to abide by the details that someone else is outlining for you instead of abiding by the truth and the principles of who Jesus says you are. That you're redeemed, that you're a new creation, that there is purpose, that there is intent, that there is someone he is creating you to be. Like you have to embrace your identity. Not what culture says, not what culture has to say, but what God has to say. Because I assure you, every single time, and you don't need me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Every single time, God's idea of you is better than anyone else's. In fact, God's idea of you is better than any idea that you would ever have. You could say, this is who I want to be. And God's going to say to you, you know what? That is so low. That is so less than what I want you to be, and what I will help you become, and who I will help you become. Embrace your identity, not in who you think, not in who others think, but in who God thinks. God knows. I love it because God's not up there with like a, a, a switch, you know, like nailing us and whooping us. Like, like you idiot, you fooled, you, you messed up again. You so, you know, just, you busted stuff. Seth. No, no, he's like, he's like, I know, I know, I know, I know, Seth. I know that, that you messed up. And yes, he'll convict us. Yes, he'll make us in some ways understand just how bad our decision was. But then he'll look at us and say, I know you can be better. I know there's more in you because of what I've put in you. We've got to embrace our identity. Your future you is going to tell you, hey, hey, look, Seth. Do what God's telling you to do. Hey, look, Seth. Embrace your identity. Number three, don't be arrogant. Be confident. You need to learn to understand and be confident in your giftedness. Romans 12, 3 says this. For by the grace of God given to me, I say, every one of you, not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has appointed to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. God has given us, God has apportioned to us, God has given us specific things. There are things that you have that no one else has. God's like, this is for you. This is your opportunity. This is what I have given you. This is what I have entrusted to you. This is what I've gifted to you. Some of us, man, we're, we're good at conversation. We're good at engaging others. Some of us in whatever work field. Some of us are good at raising children. And we should be invested in the lives of others to help them understand how to raise children. Some of us are good at showing compassion. Some of us are good at entertaining guests. Some of us are good at serving. Some of us are good at greeting at the door. Some of us are good in, in, in so many different ways. Don't be arrogant about it, but be confident. Be confident. Don't be arrogant. I tell you, every single time that I've stood on any stage, it doesn't matter what stage it is, any time I've ever stood on any stage and I've stood on that stage with arrogance, like proud, like, oh, I got this, I'm good, you know, I, I'm great. Every single time that I've done that, I have flopped, I have failed so bad. And then I could give such a powerful, significant, what I feel like an incredibly delivered message and I'm cocky about it, I'm just like, hmm, that was... That was, not, that was not good. That was not good. But then I could get up and feel like, man, that was awful and terrible. That was just bad and just humble, asking God to help me because I feel like I wasn't right or I wasn't prepared or it wasn't, just, it wasn't good enough. And God is just overwhelming telling me, like, look, you were humbled. You read the scripture. You made some points, and wow, it was awesome. 
It was good. It was incredible. Be confident. Be bold. Be brave in who God has called you to be. These are the things that your future you would want you to know. This is a season, and there will be more of them. That's okay. This is a season. There will be more of them. That's okay. That's okay. You know, so, you know like when I consider this, this whole opportunity to work at Easter Seals, you know, like, like sometimes it's exhausting. I was telling my wife just yesterday, actually, She's like, what's going on? You just seem kind of like down. And I was like, you know what? I just hate things right now at times. Like, I just hate things right now at times. You know, I've been given an opportunity to serve children that have less, that serve, serve children that have need, important need, that, that are just special and, and so like thrown out by society, so undervalued. And I'm like feeling overwhelmed by that at times. Just like, well, God has called me to this, and God has called me to the church. And, you know, I know that this is a season in my life. I know that this is what God has asked me to do. This is what God has, like, just revealed to me, this huge blind spot in my life, and said, okay, Seth, I want you here. This is your season. This is where you're supposed to be at. This is what I'm doing right now. And there are going to be other seasons or whatever you know, way you want to define it, other chapters, other moments, other opportunities, other places in your life where you're going to walk through what feels like a constant winter. You ever feel like winter is just taking too entirely long? You're just like, oh, this is frustrating. Like my wife, you know, just a couple days ago, she's like, I'm like, you doing okay? She's like, yeah, I'm just tired of the snow. I'm like, it's just January. And she's like, I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. I'm fed up. I'm, I mean, she was like so tired of the snow. She sold cinnamon rolls to buy a snowblower. And I was, I was just like, are you sure you want to do? She's like, yes, this is a gift to me. I'm like, okay. Like, you know, and it's awesome. Like to see her, she gets out there. Some of you guys have driven by. She gets out there and she's just like plowing through the snow, making it happen, you know, making, you know, way through the snow so that we can get in out of our driveway or parking lot e more easily. Um, and, and it's just like amazing, <laughs> you know, like, like, but some of us, we're like, oh man, when's winter going to be over? Or like summer happens. It's like, you know, our two or three months of summer. And we're just like, oh, so it's so hot. It, it's so hot. Like, I'm just so miserable. Uh, uh. I used to be so very, like, just awful person when I got hot. Like, I was just, like, so very ugly. You know, I'd get, like, overheated, and I'd just, I'd get ugly. <laughs> I'd get really ugly. Um, but thankfully, my wife is kind and compassionate. Ecclesiastes 3 Chapter, chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 11, it says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Everything has its season. Everything has its purpose. Everything that God is doing is something that is, you know, it's creating a monument. It's okay. Kids cry. It's creating a monument, right? It's doing something big, something wonderful in our lives. If we look at it right, seasons are so hard sometimes. Right? You guys with me? Seasons are hard. You ever feel overwhelmed by whatever season that you're in? It could be a season of relational brokenness. It could be a season of you wanting to, every single day, consider what your kids are doing so frustrated, like, I'm so done. And, just, and all your peers are like, oh, it gets better. And you're like, yeah, okay, sure. Because every single day I wake up, I'm just like, oh. And it's like, you're, you're, they're up for two minutes, and they're like, mom! You notice I didn't say dad, because usually it's her name. And, and she's just like, she gives me that look, and I'm like, okay, breathe, babe, breathe. And like sometimes, the kids know it too, like they shout out her name, and it's just like, and you're just like, oh, snap. Like, I ain't going to lie, my son sometimes hides in the closet. Um, <laughs> don't, don't worry, it's not like that, okay? It's, it's not like that. Um, <laughs> but, 
But like whether it's our kids, our relationships, our marriages, our jobs, our, you know, certain places in our life. Some of us, we've lost people we love. And that's a season of life. And we are so heartbroken, so full of pain. We just don't even know. Some of us, you know, as years go by, we're going to face the season where our children leave the home. And it's just us. You know, some of us are going to face different seasons in our lives and we're going to say, okay, the future self is going to say, hey, Seth, or hey, whoever it is, this is a season. There's going to be more, but that's okay. That's okay. Don't get distraught. Don't get so so focused on it. So don't get so intently, um, you know, fixated on that thing that it distracts you from what's happening. You know what, guys? Character matters. Develop it. Do something with it. Work on it. Your character matters. Isaiah 58, 13. If you keep from desecrating the the Sabbath. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong one. James 1, 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You guys okay if someone turns the fans on? Okay, someone turn the fans on, please. Anybody? Grace, come on. Whoo. Sorry. (laughs) No. Character matters. God is working something in your life. God is doing something. God is saying, consider it pure joy, Seth. Consider it pure joy um, when you're facing these difficulties, when you're facing these challenges because it's going to produce perseverance. You've got to let that work. You've got to let those things that are happening in your life, you've got to let the things that are going on right now work themselves out in you so that your character develops, so that you become the person you're supposed to be. Hey, guys, character matters. Don't get on the other side of a situation. Don't get five years, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and think, man, I should have worked harder on who I was. I should have thought that it was more important, that my character was more important. I should have thought about those things. But I didn't think about those things. I didn't take those things more seriously. I I didn't consider those things to be more important. I didn't think those things to be of more value. I'm kind of rushing through the last here because I, don't, I, I want you guys to grab all these, okay? Number six, stop, rest, recharge. And this is something I'm working on right now. God didn't need to rest on the seventh. He set it up, though. Like, he created all things in six days, and on the seventh, he made it Sabbath. He's like, look, I want you to rest. Isaiah 58, 13. If you keep from desecrating the Sabbath, from doing whatever you want on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, seeking your own pleasure or talking too much, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. Or in Psalm 127, 2, God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. What happens when you don't get enough rest? You get ugly, right? Not just, not just like, not just emotionally, like physically. Let's be real. All right. Like, um, you, you get gaunt. You, you look sickly. You look tired all the time. You're you're just like, like, you you know, the the, people come up to you. They're like, Ooh, uh, you look tired. Like, you're secretly saying I look ugly, aren't you? No, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because um, a lot of you guys are in trouble right now. Um, but no, like you need to rest. Like your future self would be like, okay, slow down for a minute. Rest. Find yourself an opportunity to sleep. Find yourself an opportunity to recharge. Find yourself an opportunity to stop and think and, and, and just like, like okay, I've got too much going on. Like there there have been a couple of times where my wife has been like, Seth, just call off work. And I'm like, but I I can't. She's like, you know what? You may not be sick necessarily, but you need to stop for a minute because if you don't stop for a minute, something else is going to come and it's going to hit you. It's going to knock you down. Seth, you need to, you need to rest. Now, here's the truth, guys. Just being real with you, okay? Just being real with you. I still haven't listened. Just being honest. Just being honest. And that tells me right now that I need to take her seriously in the coming week or two. Just being real. 
I've got to rest and recharge. I've got to pause. I've got to stop. I've got to say, okay, it is time for me to step back and recharge. Like your future self is going to say, if you keep on this rabbit wheel or hamster wheel, if you keep going and going and going and going like this all the time, there's not going to be any of you left in a decade. There's not going to be any of you left in the future. There's not going to be any of you left when, when, when you get to that place. You're going to be spent. Well, what, what is it they say? Doctors um, say that, that you know, the less sleep you get and the more overworked you get, you are actually taking numbers off the days you have on this earth. Like you are literally decreasing your life expectancy when you are doing too much. Your future self would say to you, don't be greedy. You need to be generous. Don't be greedy. Hoarding always leads to unhappiness. Always. Be benevolent. Respond graciously with what you've been given. You guys have so much. I know, I know, like some of us, like, like we're broke sometimes and we just like, we don't have a lot. We don't have much to give. We don't have much opportunity, we feel like, in our lives to respond graciously with what we've been gifted with. But, but there are times when we have to look, even, even like consider like even what seems like a small amount is such a big amount for someone else. I'll never forget the day that my son um, looked at someone else in need and says, Dad, I have a quarter. And I'm like, okay. He's like, I'm going to get, I can't remember if it was like a quarter or 50 cents. I can't remember. But he's like, I got a quarter and I got to give it to this person. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, it's 25 cents. It's 25 cents. And then I thought about it for a minute. I was like, man, how blessed is that person going to be when he hands over that quarter and says, hey, I want you to put this towards your need. That was like a big deal. At 25 cents. I mean, like, we're talking about a quarter. Now, for my son, that was a big deal because I tell you every single time he can find 50 cents to cram in his pocket and go to Shaw's or whatever store it is and get one of those stupid cheap bubbles. And then you, like, get the toy, you crack it on, and you're like, oh, this stinks. And then you end up playing with that plastic bubble. And then it breaks and you're horrified. Like, uh, have you ever been walking through your house and stepped on one of those broken bubbles and thought you had just had a shard of glass tear through your foot? Yeah, yeah some of you are like, amen. <laughs> you know, right? That was a big deal for him, though. That was a big deal for him to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this quarter and I'm going to give it to somebody who has a need. I'm going to give it to somebody who has a need. Like, don't be greedy. Don't hoard what you've been given. Realize where your wealth is. And realize what you can do with what you've been given. Your future self would be like, hey, hey, Seth, or hey, whoever. You know, don't be greedy with what I've given you. Don't be greedy with what I've given you. You guys tracking with me? Okay. I'm going to go back up to slide 10 just so you know. Um, Todd, I want, I want to say this again. Hindsight is a landscape where regret or redemption makes monuments. What are the monuments in your life going to be? What are the monuments in your life going to be? What are they going to be? I tell you right now, you need to make a solid decision. Now, I know that I gave you like seven things. Okay, I gave you seven things. Pick one. All right, pick one. Like, consider one. You know, seven total might be too much of a chunk to bite off today. But like, think of one. I'm going to say this just real quick again. Do what God has been telling you to do. Be confident. Character or, or embrace your identity. Be confident. Remember that this is a season and there's more. Character matters. Stop. Rest. Recharge. And don't be greedy. What one of those seven do you need to work on? God wants to speak into your life and have you do something about. Where are you at in this? What is God telling you to do in this? Guys, there is a story that your life is creating. And I'll tell you right now, being 40 years old, looking back on the last 20 years of my life, the last 10 years of my life, I can see monuments of, of mercy. I can see monuments of redemption. And I can see monuments of regret. I can. All of us can. What are you going to say a week from now to the self that was listening right now? What are you going to say a month from now? What are you going to say six months from now, a year from now? 
two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, whatever, whatever lifespan you have, whatever you are at right now, because we know honestly and sincerely, we could walk out of this building today and that's that. This could be your last moments. And you've got to think like, what is my future self going to say to myself right now? What are you going to say to you tomorrow? Don't let, don't let, don't let, don't let, don't let what you say to you tomorrow to, to you know, like, don't let that be something that you just hear in the future. Don't let your life be filled with the regret of hindsight. Do something today, right now, in this moment. You have opportunity. Can't stop, won't stop. Life can't stop, life won't stop. The future can't stop and won't stop. This minute right now is a minute ahead of what it was a, a minute ago. You are approaching noon. A little bit ago it was 8 a.m. You, you see what I'm saying? Like there is no stopping the clock. Even in eternity. We will live for all eternity. And yes, like a day is like a thousand years for the Lord. And I know that, but there is still a clock that is running. There's a clock that's running on your life and your days and your moments. What are you going to do right now in this can't stop, won't stop experience? Make a decision today. Make a decision today. Father, I thank you for faithfulness. I thank you for truth. I thank you for your secure love, our, our love, uh, your love to us, and that we could be secure in that. And I pray, Jesus, right now that, you know, these seven things, God, that we would consider them, that we would think about them, that we would ponder on them, that we would make one, one or two or, or even three choices today, God, maybe more, that we would make a decision. We just go for it so that our future self could say, wow. I took this moment, this Sunday, this opportunity, and I made a decision, and it really outlined monuments that were redemptive and amazing. And my life is where it's at now, just ahead, because I made a bold decision to follow you, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, right now, that every detail that I have expressed today, that the very critical and important ones that need to be remembered would indeed be remembered. Help those thoughts to cut through everything else and affect our hearts and our motion from this point forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.